Swami Turiyananda. One morning before daybreak in North Calcutta, a teenage boy was bathing in the Ganges when he saw something floating near him. Some people on the shore saw it too and shouted, Crocodile! Crocodile! Come out quickly! The boy immediately rushed towards the shore, but he stopped while still standing in the knee-deep water and thought to himself, What are you doing? You repeat day and night, so hum. So hum. I am he. I am he. And now all of a sudden you forget your ideal and think that you are the body. Shame on you, one he immediately went back into the deep water and continued his bathing. Fortunately, the crocodile had left. This fearless boy was Harinath Chattopadhyay, who would grow up to become Swami Turiyananda. He was born on 3 January 1863 in North Calcutta. Harinath's father, Chandranath Chattopadhyay, was an orthodox Brahman who worked for a British firm in Calcutta. Chandranath was known for his piety, courage and power to foretell the future. He had three sons and three daughters. Harinath was the youngest child. When Harinath was three years old, his mother, Prasannami, died from a rabid jackal's bite while protecting him. As a result, he was brought up by his sister-in-law. His father died when he was twelve. While Harinath was crying bitterly just before his father's death, his sister asked Chandranath to say some words of consolation to him. What is there to say? The dying man replied. Hari belongs to the world and the world belongs to Hari, to this prophecy became true. From his very boyhood, Harinath was drawn to the Brahman ideals of orthodoxy and asceticism. After he was initiated into the Gayatri Mantram during his sacred thread ceremony, he would bathe three times a day, practice japam and meditation regularly, sleep on the floor, and eat simple vegetarian food. He used to wrestle in a gymnasium and could do 100 push-ups and 500 knee bends at a stretch. Thus he trained his body so that it could bear severe austerity in the future. Moreover, he strictly practiced continence and told his friends that he would never marry. Harinath began his education in the Kambulia Tola Bengali school where he studied Bengali and Sanskrit literature. Then he went to the General Assembly, a school run by Christian missionaries. Although he was quite orthodox in many respects, he was without sectarian narrowness. He always attended the classes on the Bible, which the other Hindu boys avoided. Any kind of religious book fascinated him. He was also interested in the study of the Upanishads and he committed to memory the Chandi, Gita, Vivekashudmani and many mystical couplets of Tulsidas. Sometimes in the evening, sitting on the bank of the Ganges, he would recite the scriptures and cry for God. In his teenage years, Harinath began to feel intense renunciation and a desire to avoid worldly life. He and his friend Gangadhar, who later became Swami Akhandananda, went to the Sarvamangala temple on Chitpur Road to visit a holy man who had occult powers. People flocked to him to receive his blessings so that their diseases would be cured or to have their futures foretold. Harinath started to visit him every evening. One day the holy man asked him, What do you want? I want to practice spiritual disciplines and to realize God, replied Harinath. The holy man was highly pleased. He said, Wonderful! Surely you will succeed, my boy. But the time has not yet come. You continue your sadhana at home. Three around that time, some people came to Harinath with a proposal of marriage but they never visited him again after hearing his fiery words of renunciation in the company of Sri Ramakrishna. Harinath met Sri Ramakrishna for the first time at Dinanath Basu's house in Bagbazar, Calcutta. He was then 13 or 14 years old. Harinath watched as Hriday helped Ramakrishna get down from a horse carriage. The master was in ecstasy. 
Later, Harinath wrote about this first impression, the master appeared very thin. He had a shirt on and his cloth was securely tied around his waist. One of his feet was on the step of the carriage and the other was inside. He was in a semi-conscious state. When he got down, what a wonderful sight! There was an indescribable radiance over his face. I thought, I have heard from the scriptures about the great sage Shukdeva. Is he the same Shukdeva? For then Ramakrishna was taken to the second floor of Dinanak Basu's house and Harinath followed him. Regaining a little consciousness of the outer world, the master saw a portrait of Mother Kali or the wall. He bowed down to her and then thrilled the audience by singing a song describing the oneness of Krishna and Kali. This first meeting with the God-intoxicated saint left a deep impression on Harinath's mind. As he was inclined to Shankara's non-dualistic philosophy and a life of renunciation, austerity and continence, he did not feel that it was necessary for him to become a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who was a devotee of the Divine Mother. However, after two or three years, probably in 1880, Harinath went to Dakshineswar and visited the Master again. Observing some auspicious signs in him, the Master asked him to come on weekdays when there would not be many people present. Gradually, Harinath became familiar with Ramakrishna and began to ask all sorts of personal questions. Sir, he asked one day, how can one become free from lust completely? Sri Ramakrishna replied, why should it go, my boy? Give it a turn in another direction. What is lust? It is the desire to get. So desire to get God and strengthen this desire greatly. 5. Sri Ramakrishna's way of teaching was simple, natural and very effective. He did not ask His disciples to mortify themselves. He said, The more you go towards the East, the farther you will be away from the West. The more you increase your love for God, the more your lust, anger and jealousy will decrease. Another day, Harinath said to Sri Ramakrishna that he was not at all interested in women, in fact, he could not bear them. To this the Master replied, You talk like a fool. Looking down upon women. Why? They are the manifestations of the Divine Mother. Bow down to them with respect. That is the only way to escape from their snares. Six these fiery words permanently changed Harinath's attitude towards women. Young Harinath received specific instructions on meditation and other spiritual disciplines from the Master. Sir, he asked one day, how does one become aware of the dawn of knowledge? Sri Ramakrishna replied, A man does not jump about when he gets illumination. Outwardly he remains as he was, but his entire perspective of the world is changed. The touch of the philosopher's stone converts a steel sword into gold. It retains its former shape, but it can no longer kill it has become soft, seven like a true Vedanting. Harinath plunged into the study of Vedanta scriptures and discussions. As a result, he could not visit Ramakrishna for some time. Such absences did not go unnoticed. When Harinath's friends visited Dakshineswar, the master learned from them that he was absorbed in the study of Vedanta day and night. When Harinath went to Dakshineswar a few days later, the Master said, Hello, I hear that nowadays you are studying and discussing Vedanta philosophy. That is good, of course. But tell me, what is the teaching of Vedanta? Is it not that Brahman alone is real and the world unreal? Isn't that its substance? Or does it say something else? Then why don't you give up the unreal and cling to the real? 8. This was a turning point in Harinath's life. He realized that mere study and discussion would have no effect until he directly experienced the truth that Brahman alone is real and the world unreal. One day, the Master said to Harinath, What is there in the scriptures? 
they are like sheets of paper with a shopping list on them. The list is useful only to check off the items once purchased. When you have done that, the list is thrown away. So you should check your knowledge, your devotion, and consult the scriptures to see whether they agree. It is said, when you have knowledge of the Absolute, the scriptures are worth only a straw dot nine a few days later, Sri Ramakrishna went to Balaram's house at Calcutta and sent for Harinath. The master greeted him cordially and continued his talk to the devotees, nothing can be achieved, neither knowledge, nor devotion, nor vision, without God's grace. Well, is it an easy matter to realize that lust and gold are unreal and to have the firm conviction that the world is eternally non-existent? Is it possible without his compassion? Can a man have that conviction through his own effort? A man is after all a tiny creature, with very limited powers. What an infinitesimal part of truth can he grasp by himself, then? While talking about God's grace, the Master went into ecstasy. Harinath felt as if these words had been directed to him, for he had been straining every nerve to attain illumination by his own efforts. After a short while, the Master regained his normal consciousness and began to sing a song based on the Uttara Ramacharitam, where Hanuman tells the sons of Rama, O Kusha and Lava, why are you so proud? If I had not let myself be captured, could you have captured me? While Ramakrishna sang, tears rolled down his face, literally wetting the ground. Harinath later remarked, I was deeply moved. That very day the Master deeply imprinted on my mind the fact that one cannot attain God through self-effort, by performing sadhana. Only if God reveals Himself is it possible to attain Him. Eleven once Harinath said to the Master that his goal was to attain nirvana, liberation, in this very life. For this the Master reproached him, those who seek nirvana are selfish and small-minded. They are full of fear. They are like those Purchisi players who are always eager to reach home. An amateur player, once he sends his piece home, doesn't like to bring it out again. Such players are unskilled. But an adept player is never afraid of coming out again, if by doing so he gets the opportunity to capture an opponent. Then he rolls the right number and returns home once more. It seems that whenever he rolls the dice, the right number comes up for him. So do not fear, play without any fear. Harinath asked with wonder, does it actually happen? Of course it happens, replied the master. By mother's grace everything takes place. Twelve Sri Ramakrishna's life was his message. Harinath later recalled his days with the Master. Ah, those days at Dakshineswar were like heaven itself. From morning till one o'clock in the afternoon, everyone would be busy picking flowers and making other preparations for worship until the poor were fed. In the meantime, Sri Ramakrishna would discuss spiritual subjects and the devotees would listen to him with rapt attention. Even his fun and jokes were related to God. There was no other topic. Everything culminated in his Samadhi, transcendental state of consciousness. After lunch, Sri Ramakrishna would rest for a short period and again would speak on spiritual matters. At Vesper time, he would go to the temple of Mother Kali and fan her a little. He would become God intoxicated there and would return to his room reeling in a state of ecstasy. He used to ask those of us who were practicing spiritual disciplines under his guidance, tell me, do you feel divine inebriation when you meditate in the mornings and evenings? At night Sri Ramakrishna slept very little. He used to get up and wake those who were sleeping in his room, saying, don't sleep too much. Wake up and meditate. Again he would lie down a short while and then rise before dawn and chant the name of the Lord in his inimitable sweet voice.
the disciples would sit and meditate in their own way. Now and then the master would go to them and correct their posture. An hour of congregational singing in the company of the master would fill us with such exuberant joy that we would feel transported, as it were, into an ethereal region. But now, even meditation fails to evoke that celestial bliss, or even a semblance of it. That bliss would stay with us continuously for a week. We used to feel intoxicated, though we did not know why or how. Who would believe it? It is difficult to convince anyone. Yet I must speak out. The ordinary man seeks nirvana because he has suffered. But he does not know the tremendous joy in Divine Communion. 13 to live with Sri Ramakrishna was a great education. He taught his disciples how to attain perfection in samadhi as well as in service. Harinath later recalled One day at Dakshineswar, the Master said to me, Go to the Panchavati. Some devotees had a picnic there. See if they have left anything behind. If you find anything, bring it here. I went and found an umbrella in one place, a knife in another place, and some other articles. I gathered them up and took them to the master. The knife had been borrowed from him. I was just placing it on the shelf when he said, Where are you putting it? No, not there. Put it underneath this small bedstead. That is where it belongs. You must put everything in its proper place. Suppose I need the knife during the night. If you put it anywhere you please, I will have to go around the room in the dark, stretching out my arms in search of it, wondering where you put it. Is such service a service? No. You do things as you like and thereby only cause trouble. If you want to serve properly, you should completely forget yourself. 14. As Sri Ramakrishna tested his disciples, so the disciples verified the genuineness of their Guru. One day Harinath arrived at Dakshineswar when the Master was having his dinner. He saw that a number of bowls containing various cooked items were placed before him. Harinath thought that this kind of luxurious eating was unbecoming to a holy man. The master said at once, Well, the tendency of my mind is always towards the infinite. It is by such rajasic devices that I hold it down to the lower planes. Otherwise I could not talk with you. 15. Harinath was dumbfounded. Another time, at Balaram's house, Sri Ramakrishna was illustrating his teachings with some very apt tales. Harinath was surprised at the spontaneity with which these stories cropped up in his talk, and he asked, Sir, do you prepare your similes before you go out? The master replied, No, mother is always present. Wherever I am, mother supplies me with ideas. 16. After attaining illumination, Sri Ramakrishna waited for his disciples nearly 25 years. During the last few years of his life, when his young disciples joined him, the master poured all his spiritual treasures into them and bound them with love. He hastened to train his disciples so that they could carry his message to the world. Once he said to Harinath, I want to see you quite often, for I know you are dear to the Lord. Otherwise why should I spend my time on you? You can't give me anything worth even a cent. And when I go to your house, you can't even spread a torn mat for me to sit on. Yet I love you so much. Don't forget to come here, because here you will get everything that is needed for your spiritual life. If you can find elsewhere opportunities for God-realization, you may go there. What I want is that you should realize God, that you should transcend the misery of the world and enjoy divine bliss, that you should attain Him in this life. The Divine Mother tells me if you only come here, you will realize God without any effort. That is why I ask you to see me so often. Saying these words, 
Shri Ramakrishna was overcome with emotion and began to shed tears. 17 Since he was visiting Dakshineswar frequently, Harinath came to know other young disciples of the Master. He was very close to Narendra. Their approaches to spiritual life were by no means identical, yet Narendra appreciated Harinath's renunciation, scriptural knowledge, and Brahminical orthodoxy. One day both were walking to Calcutta from Dakshineswar. On the way, Narendra said to Harinath, Tell me something. What shall I tell you? replied Harinath. Then Harinath quoted a verse from Shiva Mahimna Stotram, If the goddess of learning were to write eternally, having the largest branch of the celestial tree for her pen, the whole earth for her paper, the blue mountain for her in pot, and the ocean for her ink, even then, zero lord, thy attributes could not be fully described. Then Narendra shared his understanding of Sri Ramakrishna, he is love personified, 18 Harinath thus discovered that they had identical views about the Master. On 24th May 1884 Harinath again visited Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineswar. He said to the Master, Well, why does it take many people such a long time to realize God? Master, the truth is that a man doesn't feel restless for God unless he is finished with his enjoyments and duties. Harinath, why is there so much suffering in the world? Master, this world is the Leela, divine play, of God. It is like a game. In this game there are joy and sorrow, virtue and vice, knowledge and ignorance, good and evil. The game cannot continue if sin and suffering are altogether eliminated from creation. In the game of hide-and-seek one must touch the granny in order to be free. But the granny is never pleased if she is touched at the very outset. It is God's wish that the play should continue for some time. Harinath, but this play of God is our death. Master, smiling, please tell me who you are. God alone has become all this, Maya, the universe, living beings, and the twenty-four cosmic principles. As the snake I bite, and as the charmer I cure. It is God Himself who has become both Vidya and Avidya. He remains deluded by the Maya of Avidya, ignorance. Again, with the help of the Guru, He is cured by the Maya of Vidya, knowledge. 19 On 14th July 1885, Harinath met Sri Ramakrishna at Balaram's house in Calcutta. The Master said to him, You see, in one form he is the absolute and in another he is the relative. What does Vedanta teach? Brahman alone is real and the world is illusory. Isn't that so? But as long as God keeps the ego of a devotee in a man, the relative is also real. When he completely effaces the ego, then what is remains? That cannot be described by the tongue. As long as a man analyzes with the mind, he cannot reach the Absolute. Atman cannot be realized through this mind, Atman is realized through Atman alone. Pure mind, pure buddhi, pure Atman, all these are one and the same. Just think how many things you need to perceive an object. You need eyes, you need light, you need mind. You cannot perceive the object if you leave out any one of these three. As long as the mind functions, how can you say that the universe and the tea do not exist? When the mind is annihilated, when it stops deliberating pro and con, then one goes into samadhi, one attains the knowledge of Brahman. 20 Thus the Master taught Harinath the intricate aspects of Vedanta. His six years association with Sri Ramakrishna convinced Harinath that the Master was an incarnation of God. Hence, when the Master was suffering from cancer, he could not believe that disease would really overcome him. Harinath took it as a part of the Master's play because he had heard from him many times, let the body and the affliction take care of themselves. O my mind, you dwell in bliss. One day at Kosipore Harinath asked, Sir, how are you? The master replied, Oh, 
I am in great pain. I cannot eat anything, and there is an unbearable burning in my throat. Harinath knew that a knower of Brahman is beyond the pairs of opposites, pleasure and pain. He understood that the Master was testing him, so he said to him humbly, Sir, whatever you may say, I see you as an infinite ocean of bliss. At this, Sri Ramakrishna said with a smile, This rascal has found me out, 21 years of wandering and austerity Sri Ramakrishna passed away at the Coast Sipore Garden House on 16th August 1886. The disciples then moved to Barnagore and founded the Ramakrishna Monastery there. In the early part of 1887, they took their monastic vows under the leadership of Swami Vivekananda. Harinath became Swami Turiyananda. Then Swamiji read and explained to his brother disciples two chapters from the Brihdaranyaka Upanishad, Antaryami Brahman 3.7 and Matre Brahman 4.5, where renunciation and the greatest truths of Vedanta are discussed. They all plunged into the quest for the Supreme without concern for hardship. Everyone without exception, sometime or other, passes through a dark night in spiritual life. In this period, the spiritual aspirant encounters subtle, unseen enemies such as lust, anger, greed, delusion, pride and jealousy. It is outright warfare. After joining the monastery, Turiyananda passed through such a dry spell. He described it later on, when I was young and living in the Barnagore Math. Once I had a very despondent mood. I could not meditate. I was then pacing back and forth on the roof. Then suddenly there was a rift in the cloud and out came the full moon in all its majesty. All darkness was dispelled and the whole landscape was flooded with light. As soon as I saw that I thought, see, the moon was there all the time but I could not see her. So the Atman is also ever-present, shining in its own glory, but I did not see it. The cloud of ignorance stood between the Atman and my intellect overshadowing my mind. And at once I felt strong again, my doubts all gone, 22. There are some monks who feel bound even in a monastery, so they travel from place to place. In 1889, Turiyananda left the Barnagore Monastery and went to Rishikesh, where the ascetics live in the foothills of the Himalayas. In the summer of 1890, he and Swami Sardananda went to Gangotri, the source of the Ganges. From there, they visited Kedarnath in the Himalayas, the famous place sacred to Lord Shiva. It was a difficult journey. They lost their way in a jungle and spent three days without food. Turiyananda then decided to practice sadhana alone at Rajpur on the Masuri hill of Dehradun. Here a police officer thought that Turiyananda was an anarchist posing as a holy man and asked him all sorts of questions. The Swami replied fearlessly, showing his displeasure. At this the police officer said, how dare you talk that way? Are you not afraid of the police? Turiyananda immediately burst out, I afraid. I am not frightened even of Yam, the god of death. What to speak of the police? 23. The officer then realized that the Swami was a genuine monk and later became his devotee. In Rajpur, Turiyananda met Vivekananda and some other brother disciples. Then they all went to Rishikesh. In Rishikesh, Swamiji became very sick. Turiyananda nursed him and prayed to the Master for his life. Then they went to Merit and stayed six weeks until Swamiji recovered fully. When Swamiji left for Delhi alone, Turiyananda and Brahmananda made a pilgrimage to Jwalamukhi in the Kangra Valley. Jwalamukhi is one of the 51 holy shrines of the Divine Mother although it does not have any image of the goddess. Afterwards, they visited Gopinathpur, Bajnath, Pathankot, Multan, Guzramwala, Montgomery and other places. Brahmananda then became sick, so they went to Bombay via Karachi by steamer.
In Bombay they again met Vivekananda, who was then getting ready to go to America to represent Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. Every evening many people would come to Swamiji to listen to his spiritual discourses. However, one evening Swamiji was not well, so he asked Turiyananda to speak to the devotees. When the talk was over, Swamiji said to Turiyananda, Why did you talk to these householders about fiery renunciation? You may be a monk, but they have families. You ought to have told them something that would be useful to them. They will be terrified to hear such things, and their minds will be disturbed. Turiyananda apologized, saying, I thought that you were listening, so I spoke about something inspiring. 24 He then realized that one should keep one's audience in mind before one speaks. From Bombay, Turiyananda and Brahmananda went to Mount Abu, Pushkar, Jaipur and Vrindavan. In Vrindavan they practiced severe austerities for six months. According to Indian custom, a monk begs for his food from door to door. Turiyananda had to beg from nearly thirty houses to get one meal. One day, he thought, what am I doing? I am a vagabond. Everybody is working, producing something, whereas I am doing nothing. He was hungry and exhausted and fell asleep under a tree in the Keshi Ghat of Vrindavan. There he had a vision. He saw himself outside of his body and he was looking at himself while he slept. He saw his body expanding and expanding until there was no end to it. The body became so large that it covered the entire world. Then he addressed himself, Oh, you are not a vagabond. You are one with the universe. You are the all-pervading Atman. So thinking, he jumped up and felt very happy. His despondency was at an end. 25 once Turiyananda said, Though I travelled much, I also studied much all along. At Vrindavan I studied a great deal of devotional scriptures. It is not good to wonder much if you do not at the same time continue your spiritual effort. 26 Towards the end of 1893, Turiyananda and Brahmananda heard about Swamiji's success in America. In 1894 they left Vrindavan to visit Lucknow and Ayodhya and in 1895 they returned to the monastery, which had been moved to Alambazar. They received many inspiring letters that Swamiji wrote from America, asking his brother disciples to organize the Ramakrishna order. He suggested that Turiyananda give classes on the scriptures to the monastics in the mornings and evenings, which he agreed to do. In 1896, Turiyananda took the responsibility of performing worship when Ramakrishnananda was sick. But Turiyananda's natural trend of mind was always pulling him back to a life of austerity and wandering. After a stay of little more than a year, he left the monastery. Turiyananda first went to Allahabad, the confluence of the Ganges and Jamuna. Then he travelled towards Narmada, a favourite place of hermits, on foot via Chitrakut, Reva and Jabbalpur. He carried no money, lived on arms, and slept wherever he got cold. Later Turiyananda said, One night in Ujjain, I was sleeping under a tree. A storm came, and suddenly someone touched me. I got up and at once a branch fell on the spot where I had slept, 27 Sri Ramakrishna had saved his life. He then visited the holy places in West India. He found that the mountain region of Girnar had an atmosphere conducive to meditation, so he settled down there in a cave. After some months, Turiyananda travelled to Uttarkashi via Delhi, Hardwar and Rishikesh. In this Himalayan region, he became ill. Day by day his sickness grew worse. Finally he thought it wise to consult a doctor and started towards a village to find one. On the way he suddenly remembered a verse that is applicable to a holy man if he falls ill. For the sick monk, the medicine is the Ganges water and Lord Narayana is the doctor. 
He felt ashamed to seek an ordinary doctor. It was as if he had almost lost faith in God. Instead of going to the doctor, he went to the riverside. He sipped a little Ganges water, repeated the Lord's name and returned to the cottage. Sure enough, soon after that he was cured. Turiyananda later recalled, I lived happily in the Garhwal hills, totally forgot the existence of the world and aimed only at God-realization. Oh, those days are coming to my mind. While I lived at Srinagar Ghat, I used to rise very early and bathe. Then I would sit in meditation and afterwards read. At eleven, I would rise and procure some food in an hour. Then I would again begin meditation and japam. And thus I spent every day. It was there that I committed eight Upanishads to memory. I would meditate on every verse I read, and what an indescribable joy it was. I used to read the commentary of Shankara and the gloss of Jnananda. And much further light used to come through meditation. 28 Vedanta says that a knower of Brahman becomes fearless. Fear originates from duality. Because an illumined soul experiences the non-dual Brahman, he can never fear anyone. Once while in the Himalayan region in Tihiri Garhwal, Turiyananda was living in a thatched hut that had a broken door. One night he heard the villagers cry, Tiger! Tiger! He immediately put some bricks behind the door to protect himself. Just then he remembered a passage from the Tattiriya Upanishad that declares that even at the command of Brahman the God of Death does his duty like a slave. His awareness of the Atman awakened and defeated the body idea. He kicked the piles of brick away from the entrance and sat for meditation. 29. Fortunately, the tiger did not show up. It is very helpful for spiritual aspirants to hear about the struggles and experiences of the mystics directly from them. Some mystics are reticent, Fortunately, Turiyananda was very frank about himself. He said, Formerly my nerves were very fine and I had great powers of explaining things. Whenever anyone asked me a question, I could see everything from its very origin to its outer expression, I could see from what motive he spoke and why. And there was a flood of light in a single word of mine. I used to observe absolute silence during the Navratri. I would feel a sort of intoxication and the mind would be one-pointed. I have done what one being born a man should do. My aim was to make my life pure. I used to read a great deal, eight or nine hours daily. I read many Puranas and then Vedanta and my mind finally settled on Vedanta 30 towards the latter part of 1896, Turiyananda returned to Calcutta. Not long after, Vivekananda returned from the West and founded the Ramakrishna Mission on 1 May 1897. In 1898, a plot of land was purchased at Belur on the bank of the Ganges for the headquarters of the Ramakrishna Order. After the inauguration of the monastery, Swamiji made some basic rules for the monks. One rule was that every monk was supposed to come to the shrine for meditation at 4 a.m. One morning Turiyananda was ill and could not attend the meditation. Later, he told Swamiji that he was feverish and had a cold. Swamiji scolded him, Shame! Shame! Still you are concerned about your body. Turiyananda was one of the most austere monks amongst the disciples of the Master. He kept quiet. Then Vivekananda calmly explained, Do you know why I scold you all? You are the children of Sri Ramakrishna. People will learn by observing your lives. It hurts me when I see in you anything short of the ideal. If they find any laxity in you, they will become all the more lax themselves. As the Master used to say, if I do sixteen parts, you will do one sixteenth. Similarly, if you do one sixteenth, 
they will do one sixteenth of the one sixteenth. If you do not do that one part even, where will they stand? 31. Turiyananda travelled to various places in India with Vivekananda. Once, in Darjeeling, Swamiji said to Turiyananda, Brother Hari, I have made a new path and opened it to all. Up till now it was thought that liberation could be attained only by meditation, repetition of God's names, scriptural discussion and so forth. Now young men and women will attain liberation by doing the Lord's work. 32. However, the path of action is not for everybody. Turiyananda wanted to pass his days in spiritual disciplines. But Vivekananda intervened, Brother, can't you see I have been laying down my life, inch by inch, in fulfilling the mission of the Master, till I am on the verge of death. Can you merely stand looking on and not come to my help by relieving me of a part of my great burden? 33. Turiyananda could not refuse their leader's entreaties. In America In June 1899, Turiyananda left for England and America with Vivekananda and his Irish disciple, Sister Nivedita. On the boat to England, Turiyananda asked Nivedita to teach him Western customs. She explained with an illustration. Picking up a knife, she held the sharp edge in her hand and gave the handle to Turiyananda, saying, Swami, whenever you give something to someone, always take the inconvenient and unpleasant side yourself and give the convenient and pleasant side to the other. 34. After visiting England, the two Swamis left for America on 16th August 1899. Soon after their arrival in New York, they went to Ridgely Manor, the Leggett family's country home, where they rested for a few weeks. Then one day Vivekananda told Turiyananda, Brother, I don't have any money. I am going to San Francisco. Now you find a means of supporting yourself. This was a shock to Turiyananda, as he was fresh from India. Swamiji told him, don't be frightened when I say you have to conduct classes and lectures. Whatever you say will do good to the people. Show them what spirituality is. 35. Turiyananda moved to Mrs. Wheeler's residence at Montclair in New Jersey, 40 miles from New York City, where there was a Vedanta 24 society led by Abhidananda. Mrs. Wheeler was a student of Swami Sardananda, and had a considerable spiritual background. Her home was open to the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, and there the Swami got a closer view of American family life. Mr. Wheeler was a Christian scientist, but he was sympathetic towards Vedanta. The Swami began to give classes at Montclair, and conducted services in New York on Saturdays and Sundays, when Abhedananda was not in the city. The students of the New York Vedanta Society accepted Turiyananda with love because of his simple, meditative nature. Gurudas, later, Swami Atulananda, a Western student of Turiyananda, wrote, He talked with fire and enthusiasm and he would lose himself entirely in his subject, forgetting everything else for the time being. Turiyananda was an illumined monk full of purity and renunciation. He was a constant source of inspiration to the students. One day while walking on the street in New York, he shouted to Gurudas, Be a lion. Be a lion. Break the cage and be free. 36 Turiyananda carried on the Vedanta work in New York for a year. During that time Vivekananda preached in California. Turiyananda startled the sophisticated Western audience with the bold, uncompromising message of Vedanta, Brahman alone is real, everything else is unreal, the human soul is that Brahman. We are bound by the delusion of ignorance. Tear away the delusion and be free. All power is within you, for you are the Atman. Assert your divine nature, 37 after the lecture, a timid young woman told Turiyananda that she could not understand how the soul could be God and the world unreal. It took me many years to realize this, replied the Swami, but once it is realized the work is done. 
Then the lady began to speak in praise of Christianity as being so much easier to grasp. Yes, the Swami admitted, Vedanta is not an easy, comfortable religion. Truth is never cheap. So long as we are satisfied with glass beads, we don't search for diamonds. It is hard work to delve into the earth, remove the stones and rocks, and go to great depths to find the precious stone. Vedanta is the jewel among religions. Thirty-eight students of the New York Vedanta Society found that Turiyananda was an inexhaustible mine of spiritual wisdom. While walking, eating, or sitting, his spiritual conversation flowed like a perennial spring. Once he was asked, Swami, how is it possible for you to always speak of holy subjects? Don't you ever get exhausted? Turiyananda replied, You see, I have lived this life from my youth, it has become part and parcel of me. And Divine Mother keeps the supply filled up. Her store can never be exhausted. Whatever goes out, she at once fills up again. 39 Swami Turiyananda times 371 Turiyananda was a living example of Vedanta. Sometimes the students would try to find ways to give the Swami a break from his rigid routine. One evening Gurudas said, Swami, there is a fine concert tonight. It is an oratorio and you will like it. You have never heard our Western music. Let us go. But why should you care for those things? The Swami remarked. You have had enough of that now. Let us stay here and read something nice and have good talk. These amusements we must give up now if we want mother. Forty, he had no curiosity for new things or any desire for sightseeing. He was perfectly happy and contented within himself. Turiyananda never hesitated to correct the shortcomings of his students in a bold and straightforward way, for which he was sometimes very much misunderstood. Once, observing their discontent, the Swami said, Yes, you people in the West always try to cover up and hide your mistakes. But how can the wound be treated unless the bandages are removed? You hide your real character behind a smooth and polite exterior, but the sore festers in the heart. The Guru is the physician, and once the disease is diagnosed, he must not fear to apply the lancet, if necessary. Sometimes a deep clean incision is the only remedy. You are so sensitive, always afraid of being scolded or exposed. When I flatter a little, you say, Swami is so wonderful. But when I utter a harsh word you run away. 41. It is true that Eastern and Western upbringing and culture are different, so it is natural that misunderstandings sometimes develop between the two. But Turiyananda was a great yogi. When the students complained that he did not understand them, the Swami replied, I know you better than you know yourself because I can look deep into your mind. What is hidden to yourself is revealed to me. In time you will realize that what I tell you is true. Forty-two women have consistently played a vital role in Western society's religion and social activities. Mrs. Wheeler introduced Turiyananda to various distinguished people and organizations. She induced the Swami to accept an invitation from Dr. Louis Jaynes to speak at the Brooklyn Ethical Association. In the early part of December 1899, at the invitation of Dr. Jaynes, who was the president of Cambridge Conferences, Turiyananda went to Cambridge, Massachusetts, to deliver a lecture on Shankaracharya before the conference members. Actually, Turiyananda read a paper, later published in the Prabuddha Bharatha, December 1913, and talked about Vedanta. From Cambridge, Turiyananda went to Boston and became the guest of a wealthy woman who helped him with the Vedanta work there. Unfortunately, she was quite bossy. Once she had a difference of opinion with the Swami and said to him, If you do not accept my viewpoint, I shall stop helping you. Turiyananda calmly replied, I am a monk. 
God will help me. I shall not mind at all if you throw me out on the streets of Boston. The woman then realized her mistake and continued to help him. Later, when Turiyananda was in Los Angeles, a similar incident happened. He was the guest of a woman who owned a large oil company. She wanted to control Turiyananda and tried to curb his freedom. Turiyananda boldly said to the woman, Madam, you have helped me with a few dollars, but that does not mean I have sold my head to you. 43. Turiyananda was truly a free soul. He was guided only by God. From December 1899 to May 1900, Vivekananda conducted Vedanta work extensively in California and founded the Vedanta Society in San Francisco. When the members requested a resident Swami, Swamiji promised that he would send Turiyananda to them. While leaving San Francisco, Vivekananda said to the students, I have lectured to you on Vedanta, in Turiyananda you will see Vedanta personified. He lives it every moment of his life. He is the ideal Hindu monk, and he will help you all to live pure and holy lives. 44. Considering the big city with all its comforts unsuitable for spiritual practice, some of the students wanted a quiet spot where they might devote themselves to a life of renunciation. Miss Minnie C. Book, a student of Vedanta, offered a property of 160 acres in Northern California for a retreat. When Vivekananda arrived in New York in June 1900, he accepted her offer and asked Turiyananda to take up the project. He was hesitant to assume the responsibility. Swamiji said, It is the will of the mother that you should take charge of the work there. Turiyananda jokingly remarked, Rather say it is your will. Certainly you have not heard the mother communicate her will to you in that way. How can we hear the words of the mother? Yes, brother said Swamiji with great emotion, Yes, the words of the mother can be heard as clearly as we hear one another. It only requires a fine nerve to hear the words of the mother. 45. When Turiyananda agreed to the proposal, Swamiji said, Don't trouble yourself about lecturing. You just live the life. Be an example to them. Let them see how men of renunciation live. 46. Shanti Ashrama On 4th July 1900, Turiyananda left New York by train, along with Swamiji and Miss Book. This was the last time the two brother disciples would be together. Just before Swamiji got off the train at Detroit, Turiyananda asked for advice regarding his future work. Swamiji said, Go and establish the ashrama in California. Host the flag of Vedanta there. From this moment destroy even the memory of India. Mother will do the rest. 47 Turiyananda arrived in Los Angeles on 8th July 1900. He became the guest of Miss Book's sister in Alhambra and later went to the Mead sister's house in Pasadena. Then, after a couple of weeks, he moved to San Francisco where he was cordially received by the members of the Vedanta Society. They told him what Vivekananda had said, I will send you a real Hindu monk who lives what I talk about. Turiyananda responded, I am a rowboat. I can take two or three to the other side of this ocean of the world. But Swamiji is an Atlantic liner. He can take thousands. 48 while he was in San Francisco, he gave some lectures and conducted meditations in the mornings. On 2nd August he left for the new retreat with a dozen enthusiastic men and women. They travelled by train to San Jose, then by four-horse stage to Mount Hamilton, Lick Observatory, and thence by private horse carriage some 22 miles over narrow mountain roads to the San Antonio Valley. Ashrama life began under primitive conditions, no running water, no electricity, and no bathroom facilities. There were snakes, scorpions, and tarantulas all around. They had to bring water from a distance of six miles and lived on vegetarian food. Moreover, 
there was no market nearby. Turiyananda found himself in a wilderness, with all these people depending solely upon him. He felt disheartened. He complained to the Divine Mother. Mother, what have you done? What do you mean by this? These people will die. No shelter, no water, what shall they do? Mrs. Agnes Stanley immediately said to him, Swami, why are you dejected? Have you lost faith in her? You have less faith than even baby, Ida Ansel. So saying, she emptied her purse in his lap. Turiyananda now caught a glimpse of the enterprising American mind. These students came from the old pioneer stock and were not about to be cowed by hardships. Turiyananda was delighted to hear the bold words of his student. He said to her, You are right. Mother will protect us. How great is your faith! Your name henceforth will be Shraddha, one who has firm faith in God. Dot 49 The ordeals and hardships continued in that remote, nigged mountain area. The students, however, had a wonderful teacher of Vedanta, who had the power to raise their minds to a higher realm of spirituality where they could lose body consciousness. In the beginning they had only one small cabin and a shed, and their first meal was boiled rice and brown sugar. After supper they gathered round a campfire, and the Swami chanted, We meditate on the adorable and effulgent light of Brahman who has produced this universe. May He enlighten our understanding. Turiyananda named the retreat Shanti Ashrama, the abode of peace, Everyone worked hard to create a spiritual atmosphere there. First, they built the meditation cabin and gradually added more cabins for the ashrama members. Although there was an informal daily routine in the ashrama, one day someone suggested that formal rules be set. Turiyananda replied, Why do you want rules? Is not everything going on nicely and orderly without formal rules? Don't you see how punctual everyone is, how regular we all are? No one ever is absent from the classes or meditations. Mother has made her own rules. Let us be satisfied with that. Why should we make rules of our own? Let there be freedom, but no license. That is Mother's way of ruling. We have no organization, but see how organized we are. This kind of organization is lasting, but all other kinds of organization break up in time. This kind of organization makes one free, all other kinds are binding. This is the highest organization, it is based on spiritual laws, 50 every morning at 5 o'clock. Turiyananda would waken the members of the retreat with his melodious chanting. He and the men would then take their baths at a well, some distance from the main camp. This routine was followed both in summer and winter. In winter they would build a fire in the meditation room and meditate there for an hour, but in summer they meditated under the trees. When they entered the shrine, everyone carried a cushion to sit on and removed their shoes. Turiyananda would enter last of all and would glance around to see that the students had all come and were in their places along the walls. He would chant in Sanskrit before and after meditation, which created a deep spiritual atmosphere. After meditation, the women would prepare breakfast. The men would be engaged in different chores, such as carrying water from the well, chopping wood, planting vegetables, and building wooden cabins. Turiyananda took a lively interest in everything, and he participated heartily in the work. At 8 a.m., breakfast was served in the canvas dining tent. The Swami would talk on various subjects and everyone joined in the conversation. But Turiyananda never allowed them to drift away from their main topic, spiritual life. After breakfast, all attended to their respective duties. They met again at 10 a.m. for a one-hour Gita class, which was followed by one hour of meditation. At 1 p.m. they had lunch, 
then the students were free for some time. Those who wanted tea could have it at 4 p.m. At 7 p.m. supper was served and at 8 p.m. they started their two-hour evening meditation. At 10 p.m. all retired to their tents. Turiyananda kept a watchful eye on all the students and their activities. He was often seen with some disciple or other, giving advice or having fun. In the kitchen one day the Swami found a woman tasting the food to see whether salt had been added. During the cooking process, we do not taste the food in India, he told her, because it is offered to the Lord. We do not cook for ourselves or the family. We cook food as an offering to God. After we have offered it to Him, it is distributed among the members of the family. So we keep our kitchen and everything connected with it very clean and holy. We take our bath, say our prayers and put on a clean cloth before we enter the kitchen. Every act of our life must be made DN offering to God, then we shall advance spiritually. Whenever flowers were presented to the Swami, He would place them before the picture of Sri Ramakrishna in the shrine, without smelling them and without any comment. Gurudas asked, Don't you care for flowers, Swami? Oh, yes, He said, otherwise how could I offer them to the Master? But we never smell flowers before offering them to God. Fifty-one once a young woman came to Shanti Ashrama. She had heard that in the forest retreats in India, the students serve the teacher, let the student, fuel in hand, approach a guru who is well versed in the Vedas and always devoted to Brahman Mundaka Upanishad, 1st February 2012. She therefore went into the forest, gathered a few sticks of dry wood and went to Turiyananda's tent. The Swami heard her approach and said, Yes, come in. She entered, laid the wood before him and sat down. Turiyananda understood the meaning at once and was touched at the simplicity and humility of this highly cultured young woman. 52. Sometimes Turiyananda would speak about Sri Ramakrishna's great love and childlike simplicity. One day he said in a hushed voice, once our master told us that he had other disciples who spoke a different language, who had different customs, somewhere far away in the West. They also will worship me, the master said. They also are mother's children. You are those disciples, Turiyananda said very solemnly. Mother has revealed it to me, 53 a real Vedantin is supposed to transcend body consciousness and be immersed in the Atman. Physical pain and mental affliction should not perturb him. One day in the meditation cabin, a poisonous beetle bit Turiyananda's hand. Without even opening his eyes to see what had bitten him, he flicked the insect aside and continued with his meditation. Slowly his hand began to swell. By the following morning, his whole arm was badly swollen, which caused the students great anxiety. The nearest doctor was 50 miles away and they had no transportation except a horse and a two-wheeled cart. Then something like a miracle happened. A young doctor from New York arrived in the evening after having walked 50 miles. He immediately opened his kit, lanced Turiyananda's hand and applied the necessary remedies. The students were greatly relieved. In this incident, they observed Turiyananda's power of forbearance. This doctor later became one of Turiyananda's most earnest disciples. In Shanti Ashrama, the students learned the profound truths of Vedanta from Turiyananda. One day he said to them, You are always speaking of being good. That is your highest ideal. We in India want mukti, liberation. You believe in sin, so you want to conquer sin by being good. We believe ignorance to be the great evil, so we want to conquer ignorance with janana, wisdom. And janana is mukti. Know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall make you free. 54 Another day, 
someone asked the Swami why there was so much evil in the world. He replied, Tulsidas says, To the good the world is full of good, but to the bad the world is full of evil. The world is neither good nor bad. What I call good, you perhaps call bad, and the reverse. Where is the standard? The standard is in our own attitude toward life. Each one has his own standard. And with increased experience and insight, the standard changes. The pity is that we still recognize evil. When we become perfectly good ourselves, the whole world will appear good. We see only the reflection of our own minds. See the Lord always in everything, and you will see no evil. A suspicious mind sees evil everywhere, a trusting mind sees only good. 55. In her memoirs, I.D.A. Ansel described how Turiyananda taught practical Vedanta. She was interested with the duty of taking notes of the Swami's class talks. One time her pencil was dull, so she sharpened it with a blunt knife. As a result, the point was jagged and asymmetrical. Turiyananda happened to notice this. He picked up the pencil and, with the same knife, carefully whittled the jagged wood into a smooth, symmetrical point. Handing it back to her, he said, Make every act an act of worship. Whatever you do, do it as an offering to the mother and do it as perfectly as you can. 56 Turiyananda hated procrastination. He once quoted a proverb, Whatever you have to do tomorrow, do today, whatever you have to do today, do this minute. In community life, there are always occasion when differences of opinion lead to fault-finding. Turiyananda noticed this in the ashrama community and remarked one day, We are like dogs in glass houses, barking at our own reflections. We see another's sushupti, deep sleep, not our own. We should be strict with our faults and lenient with the faults of others. 57. Sincerity, Turiyananda told the students, is the backbone of spirituality. One should practice it in one's actions and thoughts. There should be no disagreement between what one feels and what one says. And at the same time, one should not be cruel or unkind when one adheres to truth. Make your heart and tongue one. Then he quoted a Sanskrit proverb, Say what is kind, but not what is untrue. Say what is true, but not what is unkind. Finally, he chanted a beautiful verse from the Mundaka Upanishad, Truth alone triumphs, not falsehood. The path by which the sages reach perfection is the path of truth. There is no other way to freedom, no other way. 3.1.6 Dot 58 in Shanti Ashrama, Turiyananda freely distributed the greatest spiritual treasures of India to his American students. He asked them to preserve these teachings. Gurudas recorded in his memoirs some immortal teachings of Vedanta taught by Turiyananda. Be yourself and be strong. Realization is only for the strong, the pure and the upright. Remember that you are the Atman. That gives the greatest strength and courage. Be brave, break through the bondage of Maya. Be like the lion, don't tremble at anything. Swamiji has taught you that every soul is potentially divine. Realize your own divinity, then you will realize that all souls are divine. A cloud obscures the sun. We say, there is no sun. But the sun always shines. So the cloud of ignorance makes us believe that we are weak human beings. But the sun of the Atman is always shining. Remove the cloud of ignorance and the Atman will reveal itself in your heart. When you realize that, then you are a man. Otherwise you are not different from beasts. And when asked how this can be realized, he answered, through meditation. Meditation is the key that opens the door to truth. Meditate, meditate. Meditate till light flashes into your mind and the Atman stands self-revealed. 
not by talk, not by study, but by meditation alone the truth is known. 59. It was in this same spirit of trusting in God alone that the Swami was very strongly opposed to all planning. There also He used almost the identical language, Why do you plan? Why are you scheming? Why do you look so far ahead? Let mother plan. Her plan comes true. Human planning is all in vain if she does not consent. She knows what will happen. The future is an open book to her. Live in the present, make the best of your time and opportunities. Don't think of the future. Know for certain that mother's will shall come to pass. Trust in her. Only try to love her sincerely. Give yourself to her. Let her do with you as she wishes. But on one occasion he added, Trusting in mother does not mean idleness. Try to know her will, and then be up and doing like a man. Don't you see, I am never idle. The mind must be occupied in some way or other. If you don't do physical work, you must use your mind, read, study or meditate. And don't spend your time in idle gossip. Gossip breeds mischief. If you talk, talk of the Lord. Of reading, Swami Turiyananda gave us the advice to read only books written by men of realization. When he found a lady student studying a book of new thought, he told her, go to the source. Don't waste your time reading the ideas of every fool who wants to preach religion. There are thousands of books on religion. You cannot read them all. Therefore select the best. Only those who have realized the truth can speak with authority. Otherwise it is the blind leading the blind. Both come to grief, both fall into the ditch. Only the true Guru can lead us right, and the true Guru is he who knows Brahman. 61. A student versed in Christian science asked, is it not our duty to keep our body healthy? Yes, said the Swami. But from the highest standpoint, the body itself is the great disease. We want to go beyond the idea of body and to realize that we are the Atman. It is the love for our body that stands in the way to our realization of that higher state where we can say, I am not this body. I am the Atman. The body is an illusion. As long as we love the body we cannot realize the self and we shall be born again and again. But when we love the Atman then we become indifferent towards the body. And when all love for the body goes, liberation will come very soon. One of the students was psychic. One day Turiyananda found her practicing automatic writing. Making her mind passive, she sat with a pencil in her hand and automatic writing would begin. The hand would begin to move and write and our friend would see afterwards what was written. In that way beautiful things would be written on the paper. But when the Swami saw her thus engaged, he rebuked her severely. What is this foolishness? he called out. Do you want to be controlled by spooks? Give up that nonsense. We want mukti, liberation. We want to go beyond this world and all worlds. Why should you want to communicate with the departed? Leave them in peace. It is all Naya. Get out of Maya and be free. To live with Swami Turiyananda was a constant joy and inspiration. It was also an education, for one was learning all the time. And we all felt that spiritual help came through him. Sometimes gentle, sometimes the roaring lion of Vedanta, the Swami was always fully awake. There was not a dull moment in the ashrama. 61. One morning some students were talking about the various reasons they had for coming to the ashrama, when the Swami happened to pass and asked what they were talking about. When they told him, he said, if you fall into the river, jump in, or are thrown in, the result is the same, you get wet. Whatever the reason, now there is no escape. 
You have been stung by the cobra and you must die 60 to another time. When there was talk of the possibility of someone leaving, the Swami said, where will they go? Vedanta is the essence of religion. When you have seen the full moon in all its glory, who cares to look at a candle? 63. In San Francisco and Oakland, Turiyananda left Shanti Ashrama on 10th January 1901 and went to San Francisco for treatment of gallstones and other complications. A female student served the Swami with great devotion, but she found it a difficult task to care for him. He appeared stubborn, seemed to want his own way in everything, and found fault even in small matters. She did not realize that Turiyananda was training her by curbing her sensitive ego. One day when Turiyananda reprimanded her, she wept. Noticing this, the Swami immediately changed his tone. With all gentleness, he said, You don't know that we are accustomed to act like this in India. We scold those whom we love for their own good. We never utter a harsh word to people to whom we are indifferent. We try to improve those whom we love. What does it matter whether I am in good health or in ill health? I have come to this country for your good and not for mine. 64 During February and March 1901, at 770 Oak Street in San Francisco, Turiyananda conducted a meditation class every day at 10 a.m. and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, he gave lectures on the Gita and Raja Yoga. One day a student asked, Sir, what is attachment? The Swami replied, it is made up of the ideas of T and mine. Another asked, What are the necessary conditions to establish Shanti Ashrama on a permanent basis? There are many conditions, the Swami answered. The desire for liberation and a dedicated life, if these two are there, that is enough. 65 Once a woman told Turiyananda that her husband was not sympathetic to her desire to attend the classes, so she was attending against his wishes. It is the duty of the wife to attend to her husband and to be obedient, Turiyananda told her. Don't come here so often. Come occasionally. Try to explain to your husband what you are learning. Pray to the mother. Everything will be all right. But her husband did not pay any attention to her words. At that time, most Americans had a very poor opinion of the Hindus. They believed that mixing with the holy men of India was contrary to social etiquette. One day, seeing that the woman was unable to change her husband's attitude, Turiyananda said to her, I would like to see your husband. Sir, it is better that you do not go, she protested. It is quite possible that my husband will behave rudely towards you. The Swami, however, went to her house and met her husband. Strangely, just a handshake removed all the man's antagonism and he began to behave like a devotee. From then on, there were no more obstacles to the woman's coming to the Vedanta Society. 66 for seven weeks, on Friday nights and Saturday mornings, Turiyananda held classes in the house of Mrs. F. S. Rodhimal in Oakland. The whole house would vibrate with the Swami's chanting, Hari Om, Hari Om. In these classes, the Swami tried to lead away from the mere intellectual satisfaction of philosophic probing. He said, no matter about philosophy or even the Gita, the thing to do is to know Mother. That is the whole of religion. Nothing else counts. Take all your troubles to Mother. She will right all wrongs. How will she right wrongs? Swami asked someone. Turiyananda replied, by drawing you close to her. When you know mother, nothing else matters. 67 In spite of his ill health, Turiyananda gave lectures and classes in and around San Francisco for a few months and then returned to Shanti Ashrama for a period of five months. The mental strain of constant teaching and training took a toll on his body and nerves. His mind was clear, 
but his health broke down. It became evident that he needed rest. Knowing of Turiyananda's poor health, Vivekananda wrote to the president of the Vedanta Society of San Francisco and asked him to send the Swami back to India. Turiyananda also expressed a desire to see Swamiji again. The society decided to give him a first-class passage for India in the hope that the long sea voyage and his meeting with Swamiji would have a beneficial effect on his health and that he would come back to Shanti Ashrama with renewed zeal and strength. Gurudas later wrote about Swami Turiyananda's last days in Shanti Ashrama. One evening, just after dusk, when I entered the little cabin we shared together, the Swami told me of a vision he had had. The Divine Mother had come to him and had asked him to remain in the ashrama. But he had refused. Then she told him that if he stayed in the ashrama the work would grow rapidly and many beautiful buildings would be erected. Still he had refused. At last she showed him the place full of disciples. Let me go to Swamiji first, he had said and the mother with grave countenance vanished from his sight. The vision had left him unhappy and disturbed in mind. I have done wrong, he said with a sigh, but it cannot be helped now. 68. Turiyananda had fully surrendered himself to the Divine Mother, yet he refused her command. Why? Nobody knows. It will always remain a mystery. Before his departure, Turiyananda called Gurudas to his cabin and gave him final instructions, I leave you in full charge. I have told you everything. You have seen how I have lived here. Now try to do the same. Depend on mother for everything. Trust in her and she will guide you. One thing remember, never boss anyone. Look upon all alike, treat all alike. No favorites. Hear all and be just. Then the Swami began to chant Om, Om, Om. His body rhythmically rocked to and fro. After a few moments he suddenly stopped and straightening himself, said with great force, Control your passions, anger, jealousy, pride. And never speak ill of others behind their backs. Let everything be open and free. When anything has to be done, Always be the first to do it. Others will follow. But unless you do it first, no one will. You know how I have done all kinds of physical work here only for that reason. Gurudas asked, But what about the classes, Swami? What shall I teach? I am a student myself. Turiyananda replied, Don't you know yet, my boy, that it is life that counts? Life creates life. Serve. Serve, serve, that is the great teaching. Be humble, be the servant of all. Only he who knows how to serve is fit to rule. But you have studied many years, teach what you know. As you give out, so you will receive. Swami, Gurudas ventured, when you are gone we will be like sheep without a shepherd. But I will be with you in spirit, Turiyananda said solemnly 69 Turiyananda left Shanti Ashrama in late May of 1902 and set sail for India from San Francisco on 6th June. He had stayed two years and nine months in the United States of this, about 18 months had been spent at Shanti Ashrama. Return to India The first leg of Turiyananda's trip from San Francisco to Burma was uneventful. He was very eager to see Vivekananda again. Tragically, however, during the voyage from Rangoon to Calcutta, he learned from a fellow passenger's newspaper that Swamiji had passed away on 4th July 1902. It was a terrible shock and it completely changed his plans for future work. He decided that he would not return to the West but instead would spend the remaining part of his life in meditation and austerity. Burning with renunciation, he threw his expensive western clothes and his precious watch into the ocean. He lost all interest in work 
and even in the bare necessities of life. When his boat reached Calcutta on 14th July, Sardananda and a number of monks came to the pier to receive Turiyananda and bring him to Belur Math. When Turiyananda disembarked, he put his arms around Sardananda and burst into tears. Turiyananda lived with other disciples of the Master at Belur Math for about three months. He never boasted of his work in America. If anybody praised him, he would say, the Master does his own work. We are just his instruments. He wrote to IDA Ansel from Belur Math on 20th September 1902, the blow was too severe and I have not recovered from its shock. One redeeming feature is that Swamiji has got the rest he needed so badly. What he has done for the world, let the world realize that and be benefited by for ages. He gave his body in Samadhi, and it was not an ordinary death. It was conscious passing out. Of course, it is calamitous to us, but we must learn to submit to Mother's will. 70 Towards the end of October 1902, Turiyananda moved to Vrindavan. Having taken up active work only at Swamiji's request, he now returned to his first life, a life of contemplation. Brahmananda sent Brahmachari Krishnalal later, Swami Dhirananda to serve Turiyananda. For a few days, Krishnalal cooked food for him, but Turiyananda preferred to lead the life of a traditional monk and live on arms. In the latter part of 1903, Brahmananda joined Turiyananda and lived at Vrindavan for a couple of months. In Vrindavan, Turiyananda gave classes on the Bhagavata to Vaishnav monks used to attend this class. They lived together and would quarrel. One day the Swami said to them, If you are of such different temperaments and are always quarreling, why can't you live apart? What is the meaning of being together and yet fighting? These words surprised the monks and they replied, Sir, we did not expect to hear such a thing from you. Being such a great monk, how can you suggest that we shun the company of the holy? We may quarrel, but if a monk deprives himself of the company of another monk, with whom should he live? 71 These words immensely pleased Turiyananda and he began to show more affection towards them. Times 383 Turiyananda was very frank and truthful. But his candor in pointing out a person's defects often proved painful. One day he came across this verse of the Bhagavata, Realizing the universe as one in the aspect of Purusha and Prakriti, never praise or blame the action of others. 11. 28. 1. Then he read the commentary on that verse, If accidentally the teeth bite the tongue, hurt and cut it, do people take a piece of stone and break the teeth? No, because the teeth belong to the same person to whom the tongue belongs. Since the one Lord who is in me also resides in others, it is improper to find fault with them. 70 to this teaching made a deep impression on Turiyananda. Thereafter, he became gentler in correcting those in his charge. In the Himalayas In 1905 Turiyananda's health broke down due to his severe austerities and he had to leave Vrindavan. He went to Advait Ashrama at Mayavati in the Himalayas, where he stayed a few months and regained his health. Then he visited Almora, Nanital, Hardwar, Rishikesh, and at last settled in Uttarkashi in 1906. There is heavy snowfall in this area, and the ascetics who live there are compelled to go down to Rishikesh during the winter months. But Turiyananda decided to stay in Uttarkashi despite the snow. Devigiri, a well-known monk, used to look after the poor mendicants in Uttarkashi. He learned that Turiyananda was a close friend of his Guru Swami Vijnanananda of Tihiri. Before leaving the place, he said to Turiyananda, Sir, this is the first time you are staying in this region during the winter. You are unaware of how cold it gets and what hardships you will have to face. It is extremely necessary to keep some food in reserve 
for the intensely cold days when it is impossible to go out for alms. Please accept something, 73 having been requested many times, Turiyananda agreed to accept some rice, flour and lentils from Devigiri. There was no bed in his heart, so Devigiri spread some dry grass on the ground under Turiyananda's blanket. The Swami would arise at 3 o'clock in the morning to perform his morning ablutions. He then remained absorbed in meditation until noon. Afterwards, he took his bath and ate some rice and milk, his only meal of the day. When Devigiri was there, the Swami would discuss with him the Karika of the Mandukya Upanishad. Turiyananda was fond of this verse. There is no dissolution, no birth, none in bondage, none aspiring for wisdom, no seeker of liberation and none liberated. This is the absolute truth to point 32. Recalling his association with Turiyananda, Devigiri later said, How shall I describe him? Only on rare occasion do we come across such a great Vedantin and a man of renunciation. He was an illumined soul and worthy of respect. 74 After spending nine months in Uttarkashi, Turiyananda went on pilgrimage to Kedarnath and Badrinath to great shrines high in the Himalayas. Later, he told about his experiences on the way to Kedarnath. He and two other Swamis had gone for days without food when they were caught in a snowstorm. They were ready to give up their lives in meditation, but by the grace of God, they found a miserable hut where they spent the night. The following day they reached a village and got food in Kurukshetra and Nangol. In 1907, Turiyananda went to Kurukshetra, about 80 miles from Delhi, to attend a religious festival in connection with the solar eclipse. Brahmachari Gurudas came from America and joined him. It was evening when they arrived by train, and the place was crowded with 50,000 people. They could not find a place to stay. A woman gave them some food and they spread their blankets on the open ground to sleep. At midnight, it started to rain. Turiyananda and Gurudas rushed to a nearby shed, already filled with pilgrims and squeezed themselves inside against the pilgrims' protests. Recalling this night, Gurudas later wrote, The Swami said, We are on the battlefield of Kurukshetra where Shri Krishna preached the Gita. Then he began to chant the second chapter of the Gita from memory. A few pilgrims came and listened. He chanted in a loud voice with much feeling. The Swami had just finished chanting when a gentleman approached us. He scowled and said, What are you doing in my shed? The Swami replied, We are sannyasins. We are taking shelter here. Who is the Sahib? He asked, pointing at me. We learned later that he suspected me of being an English spy in disguise. The Swami told him who I was and that I had come to see the Mela, fair and bathe in the holy water of Kurukshetra. At this the man became quite amiable and said, You may both stay here as my guests. I will supply you with food. He called a servant and told him to place some straw under our blankets. Then, saluting us very humbly, he went away. When he was gone, the Swami said to me, See how mother plays. Now we can be at peace. Seventy-five they stayed in Kurukshetra for nine days. Gurudas later wrote of another incident that happened there. One day two gentlemen came to us and began to talk to Turiyananda. The Swami spoke of the highest Vedanta, TM not the body, the mind, or the ego, I am only the eternal Atman, and so on. Those gentlemen would not accept that. One of them asked, Well, Swami, if you are not the body, can you put your hand in this fire? The Swami jumped up and said, Yes, I can do it. Even if I put my hand into the fire, I will not be burned, but the body will get the burn. Then the other gentleman, Thinking that they were going too far, 
dissuaded the Swami. 76 Shankara said, If you want to attain liberation, shun the crowd like a poisonous snake. It is a journey from the alone to the alone. When the solar eclipse festival was over, Turiyananda looked for a solitary place where he could remain absorbed in God consciousness. Alone, he went to Karnavas, Ahar, Mandu, Pushpapti, and at last settled temporarily in Gadmukteshwar on the Ganges, in the Merit district. He arrived there sometime in November 1907 and stayed till the end of 1908. In 1909, he went to Nangol a small village on the Ganges about 60 miles below Hardwar and stayed there until the first part of 1910. It is surrounded by forests and wild beasts roam there freely. The ascetics live in small huts on the bank of the Ganges and go to the village once a day to beg for food. Every afternoon, they would assemble at Turiyananda's place to hear him explain the Hindi Ramayana of Tulsidas. Living in the lap of luxury and without shedding a tear, one cannot realize God. Turiyananda demonstrated through his life a glowing example of a true seeker of God. In Nangol, his spiritual adventure reached its climax. Transcending the body idea and forgetting food and clothing, he remained absorbed in the thought of God. His clothes were completely worn out, yet he did not ask for a cloth from anyone. Mostly, he stayed in his hut naked. One day he found a piece of cloth near the cremation ground, he used that as a lawn cloth. One day a monk arranged a feast at his cottage and invited other mendicants. Swami Gangananda went there and later told Turiyananda about the greediness of an old monk. Turiyananda scolded Gangananda, why are you criticizing that old monk? Your boat is in the middle of the turbulent river. Don't see fault in others, rather see your own defects. He who sees fault in others is guilty. 77 Turiyananda was quite outspoken, but he meant well. If one loves a person, one can tell him a harsh truth. Another day, a young man said, I don't believe in the holiness of the Ganges. Turiyananda replied, You are now young and healthy. Why would you believe all those things? When your blood circulation slows down, you will feel the necessity of believing in the Ganges. 78.25 One early morning Turiyananda went out for his morning ablutions. He saw a big tiger seated above a rock looking around. From a distance they looked at each other, and then after a while the tiger left. Turiyananda's burning renunciation made him fearless. Hunger and thirst, disease and death, cannot overpower a knower of Brahman. During the early days in Nangol, Turiyananda had an attack of malaria, and his body became extremely emaciated. In spite of this, he still went to the village to beg for food. One day he was extremely weak and fell down while crossing the river. When he entered the village wearing his wet cloth and looking for food, an old woman showed her sympathy and inquired about his health. Turiyananda replied, I am trying to forget the body and you are reminding me of it by asking about my welfare. Please don't ask about my health anymore, 79 although he was in such a bad state of health. He did not let the Swamis at Belur Math know about it. At last Swami Kalyanananda, a disciple of Swamiji and the head of Kankhal Center, learned about Turiyananda's condition from a devotee. Kalyanananda immediately sent Brahmachari Gangaram to serve him. Seeing Turiyananda's serious condition, Gangaram wanted to inform Belur Math. However, the Swami warned him, take care. If I learn that you have written any letter, then even in this state of health I will leave this place. 80 Then he said, Ganges water is the medicine and the Lord is the physician. Later, in February or March 1910, Kalyanananda himself went to Nangol and brought Turiyananda to Kankhal for treatment. In Kankhal, Almora, 
एंड पुरी एन ईजी गोइंग लाइफ इज नॉट फॉर मिस्टेक्स दे नो दैट इन ऑर्डर टू हैव डिवाइन कॉम्यूनियन वन मस्ट ट्रांसेंट बॉडी कॉन्शियसनेस दैट इज वाई दे निग्लेक्ट देयर बॉडीज एंड एज अ रिजल्ट दे मस्ट फेस द कॉन्सिक्वेंसिस बट गॉड टेक्स केयर ऑफ देम ही यूज इज देम टू टीच पीपल हाउ टू रीच हिम Turiyananda gradually began to recuperate in Kankhal. Gurudas had been living in Varanasi since the Kurukshetra pilgrimage. On 7th April 1910 he went to Kankhal with Premananda to see Turiyananda who was very happy to see them. However, when Premananda wanted to take Turiyananda to Belur Math, he declined because he was too weak to move. In spite of his illness, Turiyananda was always ready to speak about God and spiritual life. Abhramacharin once asked Maharaj, "What is a good subject for meditation?" "Any subject that appeals to you," the Swami replied. "All lead to the same goal." Then he explained the relationship between the guru and the disciple. The guru should hold the disciple through love. He should not bind him, but give him full freedom. his aim should be to dispel delusion to clear the vision the disciple should obey through love not from fear that would be slavery 81 gurudas wrote in days with swami turiyananda at kankhal i spoke about lady minto's visit to belur math she had asked the monks there what shri ramakrishna taught one had answered he taught from the hindu scriptures When the Swami heard this he said his words were scripture he taught more even than the scriptures but he himself used to say that everything he taught could be found in our scriptures did not his teachings differ somewhat from shankaracharya's maya theory i asked yes he replied shankara taught only one phase how to get freedom nirvana our master first made one free and then taught how one should live in the world his touch would make one free but those who follow his instructions also get free his words have such shakti power be free first do away with name and form and the entire universe then see mother in all then be her playfellow when i came to his room again he began at once what we know we must bring into practice at least once but shri ramakrishna practiced everything three times through practice new knowledge comes do something practice bondage and freedom are both in the mind atman is beyond mind towards evening a party of pilgrims came to see the swami one of the men wanted to know something about the swami's experiences in the west The Swami smiled and said, "The West is materialistic, the land of enjoyment. But there are many good things. The food is superior. Everything is done in a scientific way, even cooking. And sanitation is much better. They are strong and healthy people. The women have much more freedom, and they are all educated. There is more privacy in the West." and their dress is fit for action here everything is for inaction we are not so energetic even the humblest servant is treated with respect work is not disgrace a man is a man no matter what his occupation is but he must obey the laws of society there are no outcasts and no donty touchism 82 turiyananda remained in kankhal for some months Then in the latter part of 1910 he went to Belur Math. One morning Turiyananda was seated on the eastern veranda of the monastery facing the Ganges. While he was talking to some devotees M the recorder of the gospel of Shri Ramakrishna came and greeted him. Then M asked Turiyananda you have performed so many austerities. Tell you us please what we should do. The Swami quoted a Hindi couplet a person desiring wealth lies at the door of a rich man although he is often kicked by him yet he never leaves the rich man's door then he commented live in the world 
remembering the Lord constantly. What else is there to do? In the world there are always happiness and misery, dangers and difficulties. We should see that we do not forget Him. 83 In early 1911, after a short stay at Belur Math, Turiyananda went to Puri. He consulted a doctor there, who discovered that he had diabetes. Brahmananda was also in Puri, and he always enjoyed Turiyananda's company. There is a Hindi saying, when an as meets another as, they kick each other, and when a holy man meets another holy man, they only talk about God. Although Turiyananda's health slightly improved in Puri, he had some trouble with his eyes. The doctor prescribed eye drops. One morning, as soon as his attendant, Sharvananda, put eye drops in his eyes, he cried out, I think you have given me the wrong medicine. See what you have used. The attendant was shocked when he discovered that it was diluted nitric acid. Filled with remorse and fear, he began to tremble and cry while someone else washed the acid out of the Swami's eyes. Turiyananda remained calm and composed. He was the embodiment of forbearance. He later consoled his attendant, you see, as soon as you put the drops in my eyes, I felt a terrible burning sensation covering my whole body. I thought, O oh Mother, what can I do if you want to take away my eyes? May your will be done, 84 Brahmananda also prayed. By the Master's grace, his eyes were saved. On 21st December 1911 Brahmananda and Turiyananda left Puri for Belur Math, then they went to Varanasi on 20th March 1912. After staying a few months in Varanasi, they went to Kankhal for Durga Puja, worship of the Divine Mother. The puja was performed at the Kankhal Monastery and Turiyananda chanted the Chandi. He knew the Chandi by heart and it took him only an hour to recite the whole text. From 1912 to 1914, Turiyananda lived in Dehradun, Rishikesh, Varanasi, Kankhal. Wherever he stayed, he conducted classes on the scriptures and trained monks and devotees. Turiyananda was a spiritual dynamo. He often mentioned this great saying of the sage Vyasa, He who wishes to think upon the Lord after all his duties have been finished is like the fool who wishes to bathe in the sea after the waves have subsided. 85 Because Turiyananda had diabetes, the doctor advised that he stay in a cool place. On 8 April 1915 he left for Almora, a small resort town in the Himalayas. During his itinerant days, Vivekananda had expressed a wish to have a retreat center in Almora. Shivananda and Turiyananda therefore fulfilled his wish and the Ramakrishna cottage came into existence. It is a wonderful place for practicing spiritual disciplines. From Almora, Turiyananda wrote many inspiring letters to the monks and the devotees. On 8 July 1916 he wrote, The ever-free Atman takes a human birth in order to taste the bliss of liberation in life and not for the fulfillment of any worldly desires. I can hardly convey to you what wonderful joy and light dawned on me when I first read this verse of Shankara. Then the purpose of life shined forth before me, and all problems were solved automatically. I realized, the purpose of human birth is nothing but tasting the bliss of Jivan Mukti, or freedom while living. Truly there is no cause for the ever-free Atman to assume a human body, except that it likes to enjoy the freedom while in the body. 86 The Ramakrishna cottage was dedicated on 22nd May 1916 with a ritual worship of Sri Ramakrishna. Turiyananda's health deteriorated, so he left Almora on 5th December 1916 for Belur Math via Lucknow and Varanasi. On 4th June 1917 he went to Puri, where Brahmananda joined him from South India. One day Turiyananda went to the Jagannath temple. As he was going up the entrance stairs, he suddenly saw Sri Ramakrishna, 
with a garland of flowers around his neck, coming down the steps towards him. Turiyananda rushed forward and prostrated. But when he stretched out his hands to touch the master's feet, he could not see him anymore. Then he remembered that the master was no longer living in the body. Turiyananda concluded that Sri Ramakrishna, whom he believed was an incarnation of Lord Jagannath, had graciously appeared before him in a vision. 87 He had many kinds of mystical experiences in Puri. He later said, in the Jagannath temple at Puri, suddenly a sound came to my ears and my heart was filled with a great joy, so much so that I felt like I was walking on air. The sound continued in various strains. My whole mind felt attracted. I then remembered what I had read of Anahtadhvani, music of the space as it is called, and I thought it must be that, 88. Another day he had a vision of Swamiji merging into the ocean. Turiyananda's diabetes became worse. One time he was so ill that he was on the verge of death. Swamiji appeared before him and said, Brother Hari, where are you going? Your time has not yet come. Another time, Turiyananda fell into a coma and the doctors lost hope. All of a sudden, he opened his eyes, looked at Swami Shankarananda, who was seated next to him, and said, I am not going this time. 89 The doctor did some surgery on his balls. Turiyananda recovered somewhat and returned to Calcutta on 10th November 1917 with Brahmananda and Sardananda. He stayed at Balaram's house, where he could get medical help more easily than he could at Belur Math. One time an abscess formed on Turiyananda's leg and an English surgeon was consulted. He agreed to do the surgery but pointed out that Turiyananda might become lame. When the Swami heard about it, he said, I don't want to live as an invalid, completely depending on others. If that is to be the case, better I die. The news reached Holy Mother. She sent the following message to Turiyananda through her attendant, Why do you wish to give up the body? Being alive permits you to do the Master's work. Don't wish for death, 90 In later years, Turiyananda underwent several surgeries, but he never allowed the doctors to use chloroform. He simply withdrew his mind from the body like a yogi, he showed no sign of pain during surgery. The Swami spent most of the winter of 1917 at Udbodhan, Holy Mother's Calcutta residence. Just before leaving Udbodhan, he bowed down to Holy Mother and said, Mother, with your blessings I have regained my health. Except for your grace I would have left this world. 91 From Udbodhan to Riyananda went to Belur Math for a short period and afterwards he stayed at Balaram's house nearly 10 months. Last Days in Varanasi On 4th February 1919, Turiyananda left for Varanasi, the city of light, and lived there until the end of his life. During his last three and a half years, the Swami inspired many monks and devotees. Many of his conversations are recorded and translated in spiritual talks. He would meditate early in the morning, then after a little walk he would eat his breakfast. He was a serious reader and would share with others his wisdom and spiritual experiences. Turiyananda had very little body consciousness. When asked how he was, he would quote the Master's words, Let the body and the affliction take care of themselves. O oh my mind, you dwell in bliss. According to the Vedantic tradition, an illumined soul is free from desires so he is not subject to rebirth. But Sri Ramakrishna said that even after attaining full knowledge, a person may take a birth again if he wishes. A scholarly monk once objected to this view, and Turiyananda told him, knowledge is knowledge. People do come back even after realization. To be born for a selfish purpose, i.e., to enjoy sense pleasures, alone deserves censure. 
But certainly there is nothing wrong in a person's being reborn without any selfish desire. 92 ever free souls assume human births in order to do good to humanity. Part of the afternoon routine was that someone would read the Bhagavata or some other religious book in the Swami's presence. He would then explain the passage and answer questions. Following the reading, in the early evening, the Swami usually took a walk on the veranda. Afterwards, he sat out in front of his room and devotees would gather to receive his spiritual instructions and to listen to his reminiscences of Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. Turiyananda always tried to inspire the young novices with the ideals of monastic life. One needs courage and self-confidence in order to lead that life. One day Turiyananda quoted this verse from the Gita, Let a man be lifted up by his own self, let him not lower himself, for he himself is his friend, he himself is his enemy. 6.5 Then he commented, Who is your best friend? No one but the self, the Atman. If we do not know him, the Atman may even seem to be our enemy. There is no saviour in this world for any of us except the Atman. We have to take refuge in him alone, 93 one day, encouraging a young man to live a contemplative life, Turiyananda remarked, Musk grows in the navel of the musk deer, but the animal does not know it. Hence it becomes mad in the search for its perfume, running here and there, but all in vain. Similarly, we run about and exhaust ourselves till we gain the knowledge of the divinity that is always within us. 94. A person who has experienced the Atman can separate himself from body consciousness. He then watches his own body like a witness. In Varanasi, when a doctor operated on Turiyananda's finger, the attendant asked, Don't you feel any pain? The Swami replied, Look, the mind is like a child, we must hold it tight. But like a youngster it will go on crying, Let me go. Let me go. Once in the midst of surgery I let my mind get loose. Immediately I felt intense pain. The surgery was not finished. So I had to catch hold of the mind once more. Turiyananda was silent for some time. Then he continued, Do you know how it is? In the Bhagavad Gita we read, Wherein established in the bliss of his inmost being he is not shaken even by the heaviest sorrow. 6.22 This verse is explained by Shankara as follows, a man of realization is not shaken even by the pain caused by the application of a sharp weapon. Two ideas are brought out here. First, Shankara shows that a perfect yogi has extraordinary control over his mind. Secondly, he shows that such a man remains in a state far beyond the control of nature. 95 The doctors who came in contact with Turiyananda became his devotees. One day Dr. Suresh Bhattacharya said to the Swami, I have been reading the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the more I read it, the newer it seems to me. I understand it much better now, and it strikes me that probably I did not read the book carefully enough the previous time. It is amazing. The Swami answered, Yes, whatever the Master practiced, and whatever he realized, all this he expressed in simple language. Therefore his words are so clear and so touching. But they are very deep. Even now when we read the Gospel, each time we feel we understand it better. 96 During the summer of 1921, Turiyananda's suffering continued to increase. Now it was skin trouble on his back. Swami Sardananda came to Varanasi from Calcutta with Dr. Kanjilal to see his brother monk. The same year the best surgeons of Varanasi operated on Turiyananda, removing a large carbuncle and much of the tissue surrounding it. In mid-1922, he suffered from another carbuncle. This operation was the last one. Turiyananda's entire back became infected and gangrene set in, the doctors lost hope. 
Swami Turiyananda passed away at 6.45 p.m. on 21 July 1922. The night before his death, he said to his attendants, Tomorrow is the last day. Towards the end, he chanted, Om Ramakrishna, Om Ramakrishna. Then he asked an attendant to help him sit up. With folded hands he saluted the master and then drank a little holy water. He then summed up his life's experience, everything is real. Brahman is real. The world is real. The world is Brahman. The life force is established in truth. Hail Ramakrishna. Hail Ramakrishna. Say that he is the embodiment of truth and embodiment of knowledge. 97 He then recited an Upanishadic mantram along with Akhandananda. Satyam Janam Anantam Brahma, Brahman is truth, knowledge, and infinity. Slowly he closed his eyes, as if merging into Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna had once remarked about Turiyananda, he comes of that transcendent region whence name and form are manufactured. 98 Swami Turiyananda justified his name, which means transcendental bliss. Truly he tasted the bliss of transcendental Brahman, and he shared that with each and all. He was a true mystic and silently transformed many lives in the East and the West. Turiyananda was indeed an avak and of souls. His fiery words to his students were, Clench your fists and say, I will conquer. Now or never make that your motto, even in this life I must see God. That is the only way. Never postpone 99.